We left off with Governor William E. Glasscock having just two months left in office before a new governor took his place. He had left a legacy of the coal fields in southern part of the state in shambles. Mary Jones and almost 300 men had been arrested and some were convicted of conspiracy, conspiracy to commit murder and inciting a riot. We also have a note slipped out to the U.S. Senator John W. Kern and the editor of the Labor Argus, Charles E. Boswell, who are about to do something about this distressing situation. Governor Henry D. Hatfield was sworn into office on March 5, 1913. He had inherited a portion of his state under its third martial law, a grievous mistreatment of the men and their families under harsh circumstances. Several people were dead on both sides, a misuse of the U.S. Constitution. Because Hatfield was a progressive in his politics, he claimed to have a great concern over the striker situation and rushed to treat the injured in the strike zones. He released around 30 prisoners who were being held by the military. These did not immediately include, however, Mary Jones, Boswell, UMW organizer and socialist John Brown, or any other labor organizers. Even though he was very interested in their legalities, he did not stop the military courts, nor did he stop the martial law immediately. Even though by March 21, 1913, the situation looked to be improving, the attempts at compromise did very little to help in the plight of the miners. However, there was a lot of tension, and there would still be pockets of resistance from the striking miners. One of these prisoners was Mary Jones, who served 85 days total before she was released without comment by Hatfield. Hatfield then began negotiations to see if a compromise could be reached. After a couple of months of trying to detangle the mess of the strike, Governor Hatfield came up with a compromise which is called the Hatfield Contract. The miners were not happy about this because it provided for them no protections than what was already provided for by the state of West Virginia. However, the authorities were paid men by the coal companies and did not enforce the law. The contract did provide for a nine-hour workday, which was already widely used in the state. The right to shop in independent stores was offered. The right to elect check weighmen to make sure that the scales were even. And the promise of no discrimination against those that chose to join a union. This compromise did not offer the removal of the company guards nor did it address the right to organize. Then on April 25, 1913, the miners were given little choice but to accept the terms of the contract or be deported from the state of West Virginia. Rather than accepting the offer which was given, the men had their United Mine Workers officials to convene and delegates were chosen. Because of the pressure by Hatfield and the UMW, after a three-day deliberation, the delegates accepted the proposals. UMW officials tried to compromise with the co-mining operations of Paint and Cabin Creek in April of 1913. This deal left out a great deal of what the miners' demands were, but tried to maintain a nine-hour work week, protections for the miners from backlash for a union membership, and accountability for the miners' compensation. After nearly a year of fighting, work stoppages, and violence, 
The mining companies accepted the compromise, which was enforced by West Virginia state soldiers. Hatfield was the nephew of Anise Hatfield of the Hatfield-McCoy feud fame. He had the legendary short-sighted hot temper of the family and dealt with those that did not toe the line with swift retribution. Hatfield had the offices of the Huntington Socialist, the Labor Argus, and the Labor Star all suppressed in their publications. Many of the miners continued to resist accepting the Hatfield contract. The Labor Star was raided on May the 9th, 1913, by Major Tom Davis and his unit of militia. They entered the offices of the Labor Star and destroyed type and printing materials and confiscated various documents. Elmer Rumball, a reporter, F. M. Sternum, a former employee, R. M. Kephart, and W.G. Gillespie, both officers of the Socialist Printing Company, were all arrested. They were taken into custody and placed in the Kennewa County Jail, even though they were residents of Campbell County. The editor, W.H. Thompson's home, was raided without warrants and from additional protests from the local sheriff. Forty-six miners and those that sided with them were arrested in the raids. Civil and constitution rights of these men were being violated and this caused a great national attention. We will leave this here with the arrest of several people who were continuing the fight to help the miners. In our next and last episode, we will have the U.S. Senate hearings and the conclusion to the Paint Creek Strike of 1912.